Hello and welcome to the Katie Halper Show. Before we start the show, a very exciting announcement of a very special live show that I'll be doing with journalist Ron Kalik, journalist Abby Martin, and PSL presidential candidate Claudia de la Cruz. We will be doing this live show on January 16th at 7 p.m. at the People's Forum, which is at 320 West 37th Street. And you can get your tickets at peoplesforum.org. Again, that's peoplesforum.org. The show is January 16th at 7 p.m. at the People's Forum at 320 West 37th Street. And the special guests will be Rania Kalik, Abby Martin, and Claudia de la Cruz. If you can't make it, we will be streaming it live at the Katie Helper Show. So that will be obviously at youtube.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And before getting started with today's show, of course, we remind you to like this stream. As always, it helps the algorithmic suppression. Also, please subscribe to the Katie Helper Show channel. That also helps getting the word out there uh, while we discuss these really important issues of Palestine. And become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. For $1 a month, you help make this show happen. We really couldn't do the show without your support. For $5 a month, you get exclusive content. Now, today's show is a very special show where we remember the great Australian journalist, filmmaker, and author, John Pilger, who passed away on December 30th at the age of 84. We were lucky enough to talk to John last March, and he was going to come back onto the show. So what we're going to do today is we're going to restream our interview with him, in its entirety, which includes a never before released Patreon only section with him. But before we play that interview, we're going to play a video made by Middle East Eye with journalist Victoria Britton, who talks about her colleague, John Pilger, and then we'll go straight into the interview with John. John Pilger was the outstanding international journalist of his time. He was a brilliant communicator, a tireless reporter and researcher and he leaves a remarkable volume of work. 50 films, a dozen books, many hundreds of thousands of articles and speeches. All of this relates to his lifelong mission to expose the lies and cruelties of the West's most powerful regimes led by the United States. And it reflects their devastating impact on the people of the global South. John was an unmistakably imposing figure. He was Australian, tall, handsome, and with a compelling, low, slow voice. People often found him intimidating, too confident, too well-informed, too opinionated. Also perhaps too famous, a winner of countless awards, including Journalist of the Year. Other journalists, well aware of his harsh views of most mainstream media work, were probably rather jealous of his successes. For all his fame, John was actually a very private person where to outsiders he could come across as intimidating, to his friends he was always Mr. Loyal, especially in troubled times. He was embedded in 30 years of a happy partnership and great pride in his two beloved children. For young journalists and filmmakers and his friends, John always had time. He was generous. He could open doors to help people get their work seen, and he did that a lot. The roots of John's life and work lay in 1960s politics. Our decades of friends and allies lay there. He spent eight years between Vietnam and the US as the Mirror's star writer. He was immersed in the catastrophe of the Vietnamese people, hundreds and thousands of refugees on the move, countryside devastated by US bombings and the poison of Agent Orange. It was a pointless war. It was an intolerable level of injustice and pain. And in the US, the streets were on fire. The civil rights movement was challenging America. Opposition to the Vietnam War paralyzed universities and came to the gates of the White House. The assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy lit a blaze of rage. John's writing was in the mirror spread over pages and pages. He had a voice. It was in 1977 that John hit a nerve that made him notorious as well as famous. 
he made a film called Palestine is Still the Issue. The Israeli government and the British Board of Deputies denounced it. And the producer of the film, Michael Green, chairman of Carlton Communications, publicly disowned it. He wrote that it was one-sided, totally unrealistic, and in quotes, but it was John Pilger, factually incorrect, historically incorrect, end quote. This could have ended John's career, as was surely intended. But an industry inquiry ensued, and the critique was found to be baseless. John made a follow-up film with the same name 24 years later. He got lasting respect across the world from these. But the tone of Green's unfair critique lingered in the mainstream media's attitude to John. His Cambodia films in 1979 and 1980 showed the searing horror of Pol Pot's regime. But they also showed, as he put it, how three US administrations had colluded in Cambodia's tragedy. No US network would show the films. PBS, the most liberal, told John, your films would have given us problems with the Reagan administration. This harsh political reality underlies John's experience. He made so many other brilliant and unique films, from Burma's military dictatorship, from the small former Portuguese colony of Timor-Leste's invasion, military occupation by Indonesia, and from Iraq, destroyed by another US-led war. What I love now is that the British Library holds all John's work. He will be discovered there by new generations who will see the world through different eyes because of John. I'm going to introduce our guest who probably does not need an introduction, but we'll do it anyway, just so everyone's on the same page. John Pilger has written dozens of books, including Heroes, which is one of my favorite books, Hidden Agendas and Freedom Next Time. He's made over 60 documentaries, including Vietnam, The Quiet Mutiny, Year Zero, The Silent Death of Cambodia, The Secret Country, The First Australians Fight Back, The War You Don't See, The Coming War on China, and many more that we don't have time to list because he's so prolific. He's appeared as a contributor on BBC Television Australia, BBC Radio, BBC World Service, London Broadcasting, ABC Television, ABC Radio Australia, among others. And his writing has appeared at The Guardian, The Independent, New Statesman, The New York Times, The LA Times, uh, and many more places. And you can find out more about him and find, out, find all his work at johnpilger.com. So without any further ado, welcome, John Pilger. Thank you, Katie. Very good to be on the show. Thank Thanks you. for asking me. Of course. Thank you so much for joining. And look, you have people in the audience saying in the chats that you make them proud to be an Australian or proud to be an Aussie. So I don't know if that's welcome or uh, demoralizing thing to hear, but I'm assuming it's a good thing. Um, so you are someone who I could ask so many questions to. We could talk about so many things, but I think that you and I had chatted a little bit and you thought it would be a good idea just to pull back the the, the curtain, the fourth wall a little bit. And uh, to start by talking about propaganda and how unrelenting it is. So I want to ask you how you define propaganda. Well, propaganda, the, the, uh, the term uh, was first used in a prolific sense by Walter Lippmann and uh, then Edward Bernays over 100 years ago. Interesting, Bernays who was the uh, who was a super PR man during the First World War uh, was given the job of uh, cleaning up the image of the First World War, a spectacularly difficult job, and he that's when he invented the term public relations because he realised that propaganda was a word that gave um, a bad name. War. It, it suggests you're not telling the truth. It suggests you're lying, and all this is very true. So the term public relations came out of that. That's always fascinating to me because we accept PR, public relations, as, <coughs> excuse me, as part of our usual discourse, you know, that it's, I don't know about benign, but it's re reasonably harmless. Perhaps it's about selling things we don't want, but 
Definitely it's normalized. You don't have to be worried about. But in fact, it's quite a sinister term. It's propaganda. So propaganda got really underway then. And uh, um, as uh, never looked back. And where uh, do you do you think that the most dangerous propaganda can be found now? <laughs> well, the most dangerous propaganda is coming out of the home of propaganda, and that's where you are in the United States. Um, it's very dangerous because we now have uh, something I've never known in my career, uh, uh, what could be called, I suppose, politely, a complete consensus in the mainstream on the current war going on in Europe. Uh, but it's a particularly important one, this, because it's really a proxy war between the United States and Russia. And that, of course, can lead to a catastrophe on a scale that we haven't known before. Um, so um, that's, that's where propaganda is most dangerous. But propaganda is dangerous every day in our lives when we're, when we're told when we're persuaded to buy something, whether it's a consumer object that's not very good for us or it's an idea that's very bad for us, uh, that's propaganda. Uh, the news, I say, these days, not only on Ukraine but on most things, is propaganda. Uh, I find television news, which is still the primary source of most people's information in Western countries and many other places, uh, I found it unwatchable because I have to sit there and either um, get angry or deconstruct it. It doesn't inform me. So the, the idea of informing objectively, as, as objectively as one is able to, has, has gone, gone almost completely. And how do you, I've heard you use this term before, deconstructing the news. How does one do that? Because it seems very labor intensive. Yeah. It's very hard. I mean, I think it's okay for the likes of me and you because that's our business. We Every day we're reading, we're finding out, we're navigating through the net. Uh, we're looking for uh, facts and truth as best we we can. Most people don't have the time to do that if they're doing other work or, as right. my mother used to say, they're doing a real job. Uh, and so they, it, it's, it's not fair. It's just not fair on those people we are meant to serve. The whole notion of journalism as a public service of serving people has just gone. It's become a branch of public relations. But that's what real journalism is. Um, and if, then that question would only arise in a very esoteric way. It's, it's something people would be conscious of that we have to serve. We have to give people as, ma as many of the facts about something as we possibly can, not some propaganda spin right i mean you have to know so much i mean it's hard for me um you obviously i'm not comparing myself to you because you're um, extremely prolific but I, I i enjoy doing med media criticism and it and even for me it's in incredibly labor intensive because you need to know what you need to be looking at to disprove yeah. the other thing you're looking at and, yeah. and that's totally overwhelming especially as you said if people don't already have an orientation towards that they won't even know that, that that's a thing to do. Yeah. So that's probably one of the most frustrating things about, about media propaganda is people not knowing it's propaganda, not having the tools to even realize that. Yes, but it's, Katie, it's very interesting the way people get it very quickly. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, that's no doubt why many people uh, uh, watch you and watch others and who because they, I think people are now so hungry for an alternative, uh, you know, 
a correlation of this is that the reputation of journalists has nosedived. Uh, and it's probably the lowest it's ever been, and rightly so. That's where mainstream journalism uh, deserves to be. But that's left our audiences disorientated. What do they believe? The question faces thinking people. Other people, the news is just watching paint dry, you know. Uh, that's probably the best way to do it. But it's um, so much effort, so much official effort, so much power and resources are put into distorting the news by those who start wars, take over other countries, uh, and wish to manipulate our whole sense of understanding, even our consciousness, that it has to be important. Uh, you know, it was General Piraeus, the, the, the no unlamented Piraeus, who, uh, when I think he was the general running Afga the Afghanistan debacle, he, he spat it out in an interview and said, well, most important, uh, uh, people are the people at home, not the Taliban. Uh, yeah. Not worried about the Taliban. Uh, and what he was really saying, the subtext of this, is that our enemy are the people at home. Because unless we can fool them, then we're not doing the job. Right. I think he also uh, let it slip that it was not in America's best interest to be uh, involved in Israel the way we were. Um, yeah. We may have had that oh, yeah. as a moment of truth. Oh, he um, did. He like, but not in a critical, I mean, I think he probably, I'm sure he regretted that. I'm sure he got chastised after doing that. Um, but, um, and by the way, you mentioned your mother saying journalism isn't a real job. Uh, well, I went into journalism. I decided when I was only, when I'd finished high school, and I decided that uh, they then had here a very good, uh, like an apprenticing right. cadet ship, uh, that I would be, that I would join a newspaper and not go to university. Uh, both my, my, my mother, who was a teacher, and my father. Elsie, right? Uh, who was a, uh, um, uh, a working man were both dismayed at this. Um, and especially when I announced it was going to be Journalism. My father then, he was the head of the game, had a very healthy distrust of everything he read in newspapers. So there his son was heading into that, um, as it was once called, I think I can't remember by, by whom, the Legion of Liars. He was, he was quite upset. They got, they got used to it pretty quickly. Yeah. But I hope I uh, put their minds at rest. And you can read again more about um, John's parents. And I love the name Elsie, by the way. But you can read more about them at Heroes, which is such a great book. And it's 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 in my bookshelf at my parents when I used to tape uh, my show up there. So, uh, but then I was looking at, I realized I'm covering the title, so I'm gonna have to move it and make it more visible, so it doesn't just say H E basically. Um, but what else? I mean, do you think that there's a you you brought up Ukraine and it is somewhat unprecedented, this consensus around Ukraine that you see in places that, or I'm at least seeing in places where I usually find political agreement, even people who I agree with on other things. I find the world of people who are, who accept, who see this as a proxy war, as opposed to seeing this as a Hitlerian march towards conquering the world. Uh, which we've actually seen that kind of ridiculous language, but I find that fewer people than I than I would think see it as a proxy war, and I, I feel like a lot of people I used to get along with uh, and, and agree with politically are on that other side, where they see this as an unprovoked war, where they see this as uh, reminiscent of World War II, and uh, 
they don't want to stop the proxy war. Why do you think that is? Why is this an issue that is dividing people who sometimes or often are see eye to eye? Well, first of all, they're ignorant. And there's one way of, cu of curing ignorance, and that is to find out. And the wonderful thing today uh, that somewhat counters the fact that we have such propaganda is that you can go through cyberspace and find uh, uh, real journalism. You can find real analysis, and you can find facts that takes time, as we've discussed. Um, I think one of the problems there, Katie, is that too often, and I think this is in the U.S. more than anywhere, there is a, a, a kind of band of brothers and sisters, so-called, called the left. Well, there isn't. It's just not true. Uh, there are varying differences, radical differences, as there's always been. Uh, and uh, for people to regard themselves as all belonging under one tent uh, so that they kind of have the same point of view and the same bigotry and the same ignorance is slightly ridiculous. So um, I'm sure you're not worried about standing up to people like that. From people who announce, and I'm always rather suspicious of people who keep declaring their political allegiance yeah. Um, the left, I'm left, I'm left, you know, or John, I used to admire you. Oh, yeah, that's another great one. What happened to you? What happened to you? So, yeah, yeah, sure you did. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, the, 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 it, it's from the liberal. And that's a, a term that is so flexible, really elastic, but, in the United States, it has a particular power. Perhaps it's called left liberal. And it's from that source that so much, so many of our problems have come. Mm. That doesn't mean to say that commentators like you and me are turning into, into terrible reactionaries. It's ridiculous. Right. We're not. Uh, quite the opposite. But uh, it, it means that, that the illusion is created by liberalism, particularly American liberal. When I went to live and work in the U.S. Uh, and, and John, by the way, just so people know, is from Australia. And so when he's saying here, he's, that's, he's talking about Australia. Yeah. Well, I was then, most of my career has been in the U.K. where I've worked right. for British newspapers and television. And I was sent to the U.S. in my uh, early 20s, when I, not long after I first arrived in England. Uh, and uh, it, the power of liberalism struck me, the power of its hypocrisies, uh, the power of its, its kind of declared ownership of certain issues, and yet the power of its in, inaction uh, of leaving things be or actually opposing things. That's the kind of thing when you... Um, I certainly get the same thing as you, as people on the so-called left say to you, uh, how can you possibly be like that? You know, we are both of left. Well, no, we're, we're not. Le left actually is a, is a noble expression. It shouldn't be misused. Right, yeah. Um, it is, yeah, I, I just, I guess I expected more from certain people. And what I just find so surprising is that even after it's shown that the West has gotten in the way of peace in, when it comes to Ukraine, you still have people saying, well, yeah, but we shouldn't, there shouldn't be a negotiation yet. There shouldn't be diplomacy because that just empowers Putin. Well, why? Why? To allow people to be killed. Look, okay, you know, any invasion of a sovereign country is wrong. There's no question about that, and it's stated very clearly in the uh, uh, in the Nuremberg Principles. Uh, but you know you, the difference between the invasion of of uh, Ukraine and the invasion of Iraq was that one was entirely unprovoked, and the other one was entirely provoked. And that that is a huge but. That but 
has to be understood. Because if you don't understand that part, then you deny yourself background and context to something. You deny yourself an understanding. The idea that we should all go around approving something. I don't approve of the invasion of Ukraine, but I'm determined to understand it. Uh, and it doesn't seem all that difficult to me to understand because I've watched it over the last 20, 30 years uh, head that way, head towards the western borders of Russia. There's no, there's no question about that. That was the aim, was to break up the Russian Federation. It was the aim in 1919 after the revolution, was to destroy the Soviet Union. Uh, the denial of history, the denial that the Red Army played the pivotal role in winning the Second World War are all part of this. Now, it's, you go much deeper when you, then if we try to examine that, why, why do we have this thing about Russia? Well, it's, it's multifaceted. It does have to do with a kind of, I suppose, economic, except, you know, Russia today is a capitalist country, pretty much. Uh, it's, it's about, it's about, in many ways, it's about the other. It's about Eurasia. They're not quite us. Uh, they come from a, a different, many of them come from a, a different part of the planet, those strange people on the steps that came down. Uh, who are they? They're, uh, um, and it's also ridiculous because they could be asking the same of us. You know, uh, you're speaking from an immigrant country, uh, and so am I. Uh, and it, it's, it, it, it's, it's the, and the same, the same can be applied, I find, to China, uh, the willful ignorance of China, uh, of understanding the changes that have gone on to China. Just even saying that in sections of social media qualifies you to be called an apologist for the, right. the Chinese Communist Party. It's just, just absurd. I first went to China in the year after Mao died. I went a couple of times in the meantime, but then I saw it in all its extraordinary changes in growth about seven or eight years ago, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe what I've seen and hearing. I couldn't believe, uh, although I believed pretty quickly, the, the satisfaction of people with their lives and their country, whereas you and I live in societies where people are highly dissatisfied. Um, why was this so? These are questions. They're society questions, but they're political questions as well. But we don't even begin to ask in the media. Right. What, one of the things I loved in your documentary, The, uh, the Coming War in China, was when you interviewed someone who said, in America, you can change parties, but not policies. And in China, you can change, uh, you can't change the party, but you can change policies. Exactly. It was wonderful. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, it was a great line, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was extraordinary. Um, that was from, uh, <coughs> well, that was from himself. His name is Eric Lee. He, um, you know, he confused the hell out of people trying to understand China because he's a he's a stalwart member of the party. Uh, he's also a venture capitalist. Uh, he was educated in the United States. Uh, he fuses both sides of uh, the world, both the American world and the Chinese world, together into this fearsome intelligence and understanding. Um, of how of how the world is run, uh, there's so much to find out uh, in in countries like China. I I spent I spent so much time there listening uh, that I want to very much want to go back and and listen some more. I'll make up my own mind later, perhaps, but. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't mean, of course, you have you have to keep throwing in this caveat, don't you? Which doesn't mean to say I approve. I don't approve, or that I'm even making a judgment. But understanding is everything, and we have so much to learn from the Chinese about that. They take such a long view of everything uh, yep. that um, uh, I think they're on their way. Really, I, the, as long as we're not blown up by nuclear weapons in a in a, an ill-fated war. Uh, I think China is the greatest economic and technological and perhaps even cultural power will will emerge. I don't think it will dominate. I don't think it will dominate at all. It's how the old world, the world of the British world, the American world, even the world down here, will come to terms with it. That's the question, how they come to terms with it. And the benefit, you know, in Australia here, the biggest trading customer is China. And yet they have led on behalf of the United States, by saying they, I suppose it's a we, have led the China bashing campaign. The China is coming, you know, as if by the force of gravity, they're going to fall down on us. Uh, they're going to occupy us. They're going to take us over. Uh, insulting China day after day. China with, <laughs> China withdrew all its contracts. The economy would just fall into the Pacific. Uh, you, it, it, there is, there is something we need satire, Katie, but I don't have enough satire. Well, there's satire in your film. There is so much I could choose. I mean, there was so much to, to, to play actually speaking of satire brad can we go to uh the coming war uh with china and let's go to um let's go to well we can play a few clips but let's start at 134.55 so uh beijing uh looks at a network of bases a real archipelago of empire that's been built up since the korean war you have had and still have an arc of, of bases that start in Australia and go through the no, Pacific. We have no bases in Australia. You have Pine Gap, you have Darwin, and you no. have a new facility in Western Australia. No, uh, to speak precisely, we, we have no military bases in Australia. What we do is uh, operate with and in Australian bases. Yeah. But... We're not in the basing business nowadays. Not in the basing business. There's a growing collection of what are referred to as lily pad bases. Mm -hmm. um, these are bases that have typically two, three hundred troops, um, no family members, very few amenities, and are often quite secretive. They're bases that are frequently constructed within a foreign country's base to disguise it. Um, and, and generally are not referred to as bases. Many of these bases have been set up to combat China's worldwide economic influence. From these bases, the United States operates a secret army in 147 countries. If you're going to be a free country rather than give in to every gangster regime in the world, you're going to have to take a risk because those gangsters they want to they, they want to eliminate good people in the world so they can uh, uh, and, and in China they want to dominate all of the, all of the Far East they want to dominate just like Japan wanted to before World War II their goal was to dominate that part of the world today the, because there has been no political reform in Beijing these guys want to dominate a huge chunk of the planet twilight struggle Andrew Kropenovich served on America's National Defense Panel. He's a military strategist and war planner. You've written that airstrikes and naval blockades have a, a role to play in punishing China. You've described the need for sea mines. You've described the need for special forces, U.S. special forces and missiles placed in islands. This sounds like a preparation for war. 
Um, our, our first president, George Washington, said, if you want peace, prepare for war. And essentially, uh, what the United States is doing, again, is responding to provocative behavior uh, on the part of China. And just as we did in the Cold War, the idea was uh, to have a position of military strength such that your adversaries were not tempted to act uh, in aggressive ways or try and employ coercion to get their way. I mean, just last week, the U.S. Navy sent a guided missile destroyer into the mm -hmm. Spratly Islands and South China Sea. And what was different about this, I think, was that Chinese fighters scrambled. That sounds like an escalator. Well, the, uh, again, from an American perspective, the, the escalation was the Chinese beginning to militarize these islands in the first place, uh, moving uh, its military capabilities down into that region, uh, engaging in provocative behavior against uh, the commercial activities and, and military um, forces of, of other minor countries in the region that have claim to those islands. So it's a response to Chinese intimidation. Uh, rather, how, uh, excuse me. How how is commerce being intimidated in the South China Sea? There have been no military mm. forces, no military bases there. Uh, the Chinese, except the United States military base, not in the South China Sea, and not even in, in the Philippines, in, in, because the United States withdrew its forces in the Philippines. But the United States is back in the Philippines. The Philippines and the United States have announced. So. There's some satire there, unintentional satire. Yeah, well, there is satire. Kropenovich is a, a great satirical figure. He's much more he's much more important than he appears there. He was a nuclear war planner, um, and uh, uh, his own political views uh, are quite extreme. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was interesting how much denial you had in obfuscation. Um, about yeah. the, the bases, um, the presence of bases. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, there are, there are something up to, well, a divine estimate is probably up over, over a thousand all over the world. Uh, here in Australia, it's absolutely littered with them. The Marines are now all over Northern Australia and, uh, and they have this, uh, this facade that they're really uh, Australian-run bases. The same thing is true in the UK. They're all Royal Air Force bases, but they're absolutely full of uh, B-52s um, and US Air Force uh, personnel. So they are, in effect, American bases. American bases everywhere. There are 400 American bases now effectively circling China from, from here in Australia, up through the Pacific, through uh, uh, the Philippines, up through uh, Korea, Japan, uh, and uh, in places like Okinawa and, and Jeju Island, uh, they're, you know, within four to 500 miles of the industrial heartland of China. Meanwhile, American ships, low draft ships, uh, shallow draft ships, uh, are every day testing the, uh, the Chinese will to see them off out of Chinese waters. Provocation constantly over and over again. It's of all, I would think of all the news we talked earlier about news and what isn't broadcast what isn't told, that is the most important news, the constant daily provocation of China by the United States. And now, of course, they throw in here, there's been a, uh, a an arrangement skated. Of course, the Australians will pay for it. It's something like $300 billion uh, to take uh, American nuclear submarines. It's a very complicated arrangement. Some some of them are going to be built in the UK. So the UK is discovering, rediscovering its empire all over again. And it it's so it's so counter to the way the world is and the way the world should be going that um uh 
I sort of hope, and I suppose hope is the word, that, that, that people will reject it for what it is, a farce. Well, I thought we could show another clip. This will be shorter, but uh, so we don't lose uh, track of what the stakes are here. And in another part of this documentary, you are interviewing a scientist and he talks about what's at stake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The scientific studies that I teach by the scientists that predict that the Earth can be made essentially uninhabitable from nuclear war, the scientists have been begging the Obama administration, well, they wouldn't say begging, but they've made multiple requests to meet with them and discuss these predictions because they're peer-reviewed studies and they've been turned down over and over again. They've been peripherally told that, well, we don't think uh, the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are all that important if the immediate effects of nuclear war don't stop it. But the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are liable to wipe out the human race. In one exchange, nuclear exchange between the U.S. and China, what could be the consequences? Well, let me just give you an example of what one Chinese four or five megaton warhead would do to a city in the United States. If it got through, uh, the detonation of that weapon over a city would instantly ignite about six or seven hundred square miles on fire. And, and within 20 to 30 minutes, all of those fires would coalesce into a single gigantic firestorm. There would be no escape from it. So all the people there would perish. So the U.S. with, say, hundreds of nuclear weapons on Chinese cities. Well, when you combine all the smoke from these nuclear weapons detonating, it actually creates millions of tons of smoke, black carbon smoke, will rise above cloud level into the stratosphere. It's heated by the sun, it acts like a solar collector. And that smoke, because of that, will stay there for 10 years or longer. And what the smoke does is to blocks warming sunlight from reaching the surface of the earth. And it becomes so cold in a matter of just a couple of weeks that will, the temperatures will fall below freezing every day for one to three years. And it will become too cold to grow food crops for at least 10 years or longer. Yeah. So yeah. something that people should, I mean, that's, that, we never hear about this uh, in the news, never hear the con a real concern about this. In fact, we had people kind of downplaying the risks of nuclear war uh in order to i would say encourage the the proxy war in ukraine yeah and it was that uh that excellent analyst there stephen Starr, i think from the university of missouri uh another part of the interview he 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 talked about the delegations of scientists yeah. that have gone to the white house the right. obama white house then and i just just haven't got in the door. Um, I mean, it does seem quite remarkable that with everything we know about the effects of nuclear weapons, of, of what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and elsewhere, uh, we're still prepared to almost blithely ignore the evidence that you've just put on the screen. Uh, that's down to the media. The media has a responsibility and that's its silence on this is a shirking of responsibility with two equals. It's like prop what you refer to as propaganda by omission. Yes. And that's the great, that is the most powerful, the most potent propaganda is by omission. I would think that, uh, as we talked at the beginning of the show, when someone's watching the news, what's the first question they should ask? It should be, what's left out? What's, what, are, what were they not telling us? Uh, and uh, uh, we know from 
all the, the, the selectivity of the reporting of conflicts, as, as you found, you yourself found out recently of, of in Palestine, you watch the little that you, you do see report from the occupied terrorists, what's left out, what's left out. Uh, most, most of it is left out. And that is true now of Ukraine, of course, uh, what's left out. What are some of the things that you would advise people to keep in mind uh, when reading about Ukraine, when reading about Palestine, when reading about China? Any major insights or things that you know frequently get distorted or ignored? Look to the history. It doesn't mean to say that you have to uh, become immediately a history student all over again. Uh, just look to the recent past. Start reading. Then don't take um, don't don't take as read what you're being told. That's very important. Uh, take take what is being said and take it back and look at it in the context of history. Finding out about Ukraine, what's the history of Ukraine? Where did it come from? Um, uh, it was part of the Soviet Union, a key part of the Soviet Union. Uh, what is this about Ukraine divided into two countries, one Russian speaking? Uh, I mean, that is, is not difficult to find out, but I think people who seriously want to understand the news and see, should see the news only as a facade, then look behind it, look at the history. And what is the role of a committed journalist, because you and I, we obviously have commitments, ideologies. How sure. do you balance that with reporting? What is what is the the? Is there like a formula? Um, well, you 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 don't lie. Right. You tell the truth. You tell no the truth about what, what you're everyone, doing. Everyone has a has their own view, right. and what you find out. Uh, as the more I traveled in what was then called the third world, I realized very quickly how the world was run, how it was ordered, and who was in charge of power, and who were the receivers of this power and the victims of this power. And that helped form my own politics, as it were. There's no question about that. Uh, so just the very the nature of the journalism I was doing uh, informed, inform the politics. But uh, I don't like the word suspended, but I suppose it is suspended. You can suspend that if you're, if you're stating something objectively. You find out something that you're almost certain is true. You can't be absolutely certain it is true. So perhaps you have to qualify it. But uh, it, it, that is as close to objectivity as you can be. Uh, it's not, as say, the BBC like to teach its, its people that it's a kind of nirvana that you rise to and then you see the light and that there is, there is the impartiality. I go towards that light and I'll only broadcast in passing. That's absolute nonsense because most of what they do anyway is biased. Uh, but dressed up, it's in this whole well in nonsense about it being in, impartial. But it is, if not, there's no such thing as impartiality, but you can be objective. And that really depends on yourself, uh, whether you want to be or whether you you know, the moment you're not, you become a propagandist. So what's the difference between um, impartial and objective? Well, impartial, I suppose, is that you're, you're not impartial. If you're asked right. about the Middle East, you'll, you'll give your view. What's right. your view when you'll give your view or based on your knowledge? Uh, if I'm asked the same question, I will go. So I'm not impartial. I can't be impartial. Uh, I can't lie about it and say, well, as a matter of fact, yes, no, I know the Middle East and Israel has every right to uh, right. Uh, 
uh, be in the occupied the territory. Itself, as they say. All of that. You know, uh, it's an absurdity. There isn't. Uh, but the two are often confused. To be objective about something that may concern whether it's, um, let's say, uh, the, the background to a uh, Hamas attack on Gaza, uh, you have to tell what Hamas did, what they, uh, sorry, Hamas attack on Israel, you have to tell what Hamas did. But at the same time, here again, because that's an area that has been so starved of facts, you have to, it's your responsibility to supply the background, the the recent history, uh, and to cut through as much of the, the bigotry as possible. Um, I think it's something that I think serious journalists who don't see themselves as opinionated so much so much journalism is opinion. I was looking at The Guardian the other day, which I used to write. Um, well, let's say even up to 10, 15 years ago, a news story on the front would say what happened. There might be lots of opinion pieces inside commenting on it, but now it tells you how to think from the first sentence. Uh, and I think that is true of all the major newspapers proclaiming their, their divine impartiality. Um, they're not. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's that empty, uh, opinion, opinion that is simply voicing bigotry that is the essence of propaganda. Mm, yeah, and the most dangerous kind is the is the kind that pretends to not have yes. any uh, partiality or any ideology behind it. They're just calling strikes and balls. Yeah, yes. That's when you but really have to be careful. In front of you. You know, you may, may not like what you've seen. Uh, right. Offend you uh, or offend your your allegiances, let's say. But what I'm saying is you have to, if you're as a reporter, and I've been a reporter a lot of my life, you have to say what it is. Um, you can give the context, right. but up front, you've got to say what it is. Right. Another way, of course, that a, a bias is uh, communicated is to who you're speaking to. So you in your film, um, uh, The Unseen War, uh, uh, no, it's w the war you don't see. Sorry, in the war you don't see, you ask someone how who they speak to on behalf of the Palestinians, and yeah. there's no, you know, there's no Palestinian equivalent of the spokesperson for the Israeli yeah. government who they seek out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which which you yeah, point I out. Remember that. that was a, a TV news editor. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think she was at the yeah. BBC. Yeah, yes, I think it was a BBC, a rather worried woman yeah. who was interviewing, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, well, that was a very rare interview. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And everyone has to watch this also, the war uh, you don't see, because I can't believe that these people sat down with you to talk to you. Did they not yeah. know who you are? I mean, I guess you're... Yeah. Oh you're, yes, thank you. You're so respected that I guess yeah. I mean that they they're excited to talk to you. I was just I didn't know how they would put themselves in that position. You weren't unfair. It wasn't gotcha moments, but you just presented reality to them, and they tried to deny it a bunch of times. Well, I think that was the end of a period which you could still, with a lot of hard work, get people from. The official world, let's call it that, the corporate world, to come and answer questions, to be challenged. Um, it may they they may be very good at that. And they may walk away from the interview and and not told you anything. Um, but now, uh, the film I made after that, which was on the privatization of the health service, oh, in yeah. the UK, 
Another great one. Uh, I didn't get a single official, and I had to use something I don't like doing because it's kind of it sort of recognised as a failure in a sense. I had to do all the people I'd asked to be interviewed, and all the people who said no. Oh right, yeah. Ignored me. So it used to be called the empty chair ch syndrome. And once uh, corporate PR, they were quite slow in understanding. I understood that if they just didn't turn up, right, uh, they made life very, very difficult for you because you had no other side. Um, and um, it's, um, but now it's, I find it almost impossible to get anyone to talk to. Uh, hey. from, no, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, that's uh, from either in, uh, as used to be, I used to get people to talk to me in, in the Pentagon and the State Department. And uh, um, there was once, once during one interview in the State Department where uh, um, uh, one of the press uh, people came in and I was interviewing, uh, who was I interviewing? I think. That's right, Marilyn Albright's uh, mouthpiece, Jamie Rubin. And uh, he walked into the room and he's, he mouthed, not you. <laughs> and he was the only one who recognized me. Right. And my, my, producer, my producer, of course, then spent the next half an hour virtually holding him down on the floor so that he didn't say anything. Well, right. I mean, abusing to us but it, it also marked the end i can't get an interview in washington now. right uh, was it I because of the film you, you, or a change in the times or combination and someone in the chat pointed out it's it was fran unworth who's the uh, journalist fran, fran unsworth yeah that's right. unsworth yeah and thank you and news. i just scrolled past the fran chat unsworth. that highlighted yeah. yeah she was head of news right at, at the bbc she never appeared in an interview like that before. And I, uh, the BBC's rival in the UK is ITV, for which I was making the film. And so I put it to them, look, it's going to look rather odd, isn't it? But here's an ITV. ITV have agreed to speak, to fall on their sword, as it were, um, to us. Uh, and to be challenged by me and so on, but not the BBC. So for some reason, this clicked in some uh, BBC brain somewhere, and Fran Unsworth was presented never again. Right. What was it like um, working for Robert Maxwell? Well, I, I, uh, it was working for Robert Maxwell. I spent most of the time avoiding him and avoiding being, um, accompanying him to places all over the world so that I could be his personal reporter reporting what a wonderful humanitarian was. He wanted to take me to Ethiopia with a plane load of, uh, um, supplies, uh, um, <clears throat> out to the Far East and Eastern Europe. Um, I managed to avoid him and, uh, for so long, and then he fired me. Um, but um, it was a nightmare. Um, he turned the paper into a family album. Um, all his uh, Ghislaine, who, of course, achieved her own notoriety later, yeah was often in the paper with father and uh, uh, he um, yeah it was it was a quite a grotesque period actually because this man was um, there, I've never met any, anyone like him he was huge physically huge he ate two meals when you ate one. Um, he shouted and fired people on the spot. He, uh, uh, he sat outside the paper in his Rolls Royce, uh, um, which was his office. And 
I mean, I love eccentrics, and uh, I'm not sure he was one. He was just a, a brute because right. he was a crook. In the end, he he stole uh, the newspaper's pension scheme. Disgusting. Uh, and then mysteriously disappeared over the side of his yacht. Yeah, uh, any, any ideas about what happened there? Oh, there are all sorts of ideas. I, would, I think he, he decided to end it. They were coming for him, and it was, you know, big stuff. There's been a lot that he he was very much tied up with Israel, uh, and it said that perhaps did Mossad do it because he could spill the beans? I don't know. It doesn't sound. It sounds unlikely. They gave him in Israel. They gave him an extraordinary memorial service, only given to former presidents and prime ministers. So he um, he was a man with fingers. Um, all over the world, a very sinister um, character. But, um, yeah, it was an interesting time. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, you've been so generous with your time. I just wanted to ask you one more question. I oh. mean, I'd love to ask you many more, but I'm going to be respectful of your time and ask you one more, which is that what is it that the West wants in China, in Ukraine? Um, in Syria, what is the objective of the, of the West? People talk the about hegemony, uh, or yeah. Main objective is to is to break up Russia. That has been the objective um, since the Soviet Union was formed, and and they've said it. Uh, you know, we've had. Uh, I forgot, sorry, I forgot his name. The Defense Secretary uh, said it recently. Blink Blinken. Mm -hmm. Blinken. Oh no, Mark, uh, the Defense Secretary. That would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he. Uh, he uh, said it Austin. About, Austin. Yeah, Austin. Yeah. Um, he said the aim was to to weaken Russia. Right. To weaken Russia. Um, he let it slip out, and few others have let it slip out. But it, it's just, it's known. That's, it, it, it's, once you weaken Russia, then you can concentrate on the main game, the main so-called enemy, and that's China. Uh, this is, what does it want? It wants to, it wants to continue the dominance of the United States. I don't think many people truly understand historically, socially, the, the sense of dominance that American power has, particularly has about itself, the way it dom dominates the world, ignores laws, talks about rules-based orders when in fact it has no rules, uh it uh it goes for china over um islands in the uh in the south china sea and it refuses to sign the law of the sea and so on and so forth uh it uh it gives israel an impunity to do what it likes to break every united nations um covenant that that, that exists uh it it's it's, uh, um, I mean, all empires have done it. The British did this in a different way before, but they did the same thing. Uh, but uh, th this, the, the, the British knew their time was up and they knew a way to keep kind of going without getting into too much obvious trouble. And that was his number two to the United States uh, and the U.S. Uh, what is the aim? The aim is to stay dominant, to stay in charge, uh, even when it makes no sense. I mean, they're not going to stay in charge of the economy. Well, they don't. They're not in charge of it now. Um, the you know the. The, work, the workshop of the world is in China and has been there. The workshop of the great American corporations is in China. Uh, there's a, a shared labor, if you like, between 
between great powers, but uh, it it I I often ask myself what the what is the power of this almost mythical exceptionalism that the United States infuses into its society. And I've had it from, we talked about people on the left. I can hear people on the left who have it, who think that it means something, that they're different. Uh, they sure are. They represent a country that it causes absolute mayhem all over the world, or a government does. They also represent probably the greatest opponents for that mayhem, I should say, um, or potential opponents. But uh, I think it's preserving that dominance. I don't think it's. I don't think it's more than that. It's pre it's quite specific in that American power has always operated, say, the gateways to fossil fuel sources. That makes sense. Um, and to, for all, all other resources, water and so on, cutting Russia off from the Black Sea, uh, from uh, uh, from from its, its its deep sea port in Crimea and everything, because that would be a NATO base now if Russia had uh, annexed that. No question about that. Um, so. It is, it is being in charge, um, and uh, uh, there's nothing to gain in going to war over Taiwan for the United States. Most of the semiconductors of the world are, are made in, in Taiwan that end up in the United States. Uh, the, the, there's nothing to be gained whatsoever. It is this, almost this, uh, amorphous thing of we must dominate. I've sat in front of people in government and heard this, and I have to say it comes across in almost an evangelical way from Democrats more than it does from Republicans. Republicans are just damn cynical. Um, but, but Democrats could actually give you the speech. Um, you think they're more true believers than Republicans on this? Oh, I know. It's, a, it's a wild guess of mine, Katie. Yes. I mean, Demi Democrats have started most of the wars. Right. Republicans haven't. Democrats have started most of the wars, got yeah. them going. Um, you know, um, I mean, the, the present, a lot of the present trouble with the, with the Russians was started during the Carter period. And, right. And Jimmy Carter is at the moment being sanctified uh, um, yet again, uh, and uh, not without cause, perhaps. I don't know. I'm a nice man, um, but uh, uh, that he hasn't acted like an American president right. is just absurd. Of course, he has. Yeah, maybe since step since not being president, maybe because he does Habitat for Humanity. Since not being, since not being president. Yes. Yeah. Where yes. it doesn't count as much. Oh, it has done some, yeah. some interesting things. Right. Much better but than the Clinton Foundation. Is, a, is quite a powerful uh, uh, arm of uh, Western power. Yeah. Uh, and benign, yes, and helpful a lot of the time. Uh, let's, let's, let's give Jimmy Carter yeah. a nice pick there. Okay, yeah. yeah. I have to have Robert Shear back on to talk about him since he's the He's the one who asked him, whose question provoked that, you know, that response yeah. about the impure thoughts. Yeah. Um, for Playboy, Very that Playboy uh, interview. Um, I know I said last question, but one more. Or sure. No, okay. okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Wanted to know your thoughts um, on, if you hadn't, I know you're going to have something to say about Julian Assange. And so I feel like we should mention him because you've been such an outspoken advocate for him. Um, and I also want to know what your thoughts on the Nord Stream Pipeline uh, Cy Hirsch story is. Yeah, well, the Cy Hirsch story, um, uh, just common sense. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, with, with, with all anonymous source journalism, 
you then have to look who's written this. Well, Cy Hirsch has written it. And Cy Hirsch's track record is quite extraordinary. Uh, so I go with Cy Hirsch. And also there's the added ingredient that it's common sense uh, that that happened. And that the cover stories have been so badly handled the idea of blaming the Russians. And, and now, since then, there's, you know, they've tried to push out something about um, a Ukrainian group did it. Well, that's sort of backing yeah, up. It's a lot of knowing. Um, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So, uh, yes. It also, it's, it's quite frightening, actually, that they would do that. That that is, you know, that is an act of war. That is active in the past. Wars of First World War may have been started by the assassination of the Archduke. Uh, there'd been something like a pipeline being blown up. It would have started a lot earlier. Um, so there's so dangerous acts like that. So irresponsible. So reckless. And that's, and that's the truth of this administration. So reckless. Uh, to do something like that, uh, because that that endangers all of us. Right. Um, sorry. It also, and it, it reminds me also the the idea that it was so sellable that the Russians did it reminds me in a way of the way that the idea that Saddam Hussein was behind nine eleven was so sellable because there's a similar kind of Orientalism and othering right. which allows you to believe these things like. Of course, Russia wouldn't do it. It's not in their best interest. But Russia is turned into this weird creature of a country, a yeah. w weird people with their weird ways that it would be a Russian thing to blow up its own pipeline. Yeah. And it, it defies common sense, just like having Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden work together defies common sense. But those yeah. people, too, they're, they're just this amorphous of Arab, Muslim, terrorism blob. Look at the way Russians are portrayed in popular culture. Uh, you know, um, I saw a film that was meant to be, I suppose, a bit of a satire. It wasn't about, uh, I've forgotten the title, but it was something like The Death of Stalin. Yeah. And, and, you know, all the Russians were wooden stereotypes. None of them were clearly free, clear thinking. Uh, erudite, literate people. Uh, and the same is true with China. China, it's more clear because it's so racist. When the United States had a law that lasted for a, a century, from the middle of the 19th century, it was only abandoned when they had to get on side with Chiang Kai-shek in 1944, banning all Chinese from the United States. The same in this country. Uh, the, the racism in, in uh, uh, it's racism on an epic scale. It's it's dismissing a whole people, regarding them as you rightly uh, caricatured how the Russians are seen as some strange monster. It goes back to the the crudest propaganda of the First World War when the Germans were ate Belgian babies, and no doubt there were people who believed they ate Belgian babies. Uh, well, as Saddam was saying, the incubator baby, right, the baby right. uh, that's a version of the, that's all. Uh, so nothing, nothing really changes in that kind of, uh, in that kind of, uh, propaganda, but it's, it's, um, I mean, you've raised, you've touched on something that is infinitely interesting. How then to turn this around and get us or just get people to start thinking of them as like us, as people, uh, with different systems, different ways, different cultures, as the world is. But how do we get them thinking and not to buy this utterly reckless fictional version of the rest of humanity. And the other question I'd asked, speaking of uh, caricatures and vilifications and smears, was about Julian Assange. Yeah. Well, Julian, Julian is the 
is the victim of all this. He's emblematic of it. What has happened to Julian probably is there have been versions of, of this kind of miscarriage of justice, but I don't think anything quite as stark and as horrific uh, as this when um, the so-called uh, the reputable uh, justice system in the United Kingdom is bent before your eyes when judges uh, will sit in the high court and accept evidence that is not evidence at all. It is simply, again, propaganda passed over by the Americans trying to extradite them. Um, I'm not sure that's happened before. Perhaps it has. Um, so um, Julian is uh, um, Ju Julian has become it's become an obsessive hunt. Um, whether whether they will succeed, I don't know. I can, you know, as you can hear, I can't even make up my own mind now. I saw Julian not long ago in Belmarsh Prison. How was and, he? And the good news is, well, he was on one of his updates. He goes huh. up and down, up and down, you know, with extreme anxiety, clearly. Uh, but on this day, we had two hours of talking, talking about books and uh, various, I sent him books from time to time. Um, he. Uh, he seemed to me to be in relatively good form. He wasn't as thin as he had been when he first went into Belmarsh. He'd lost almost overnight something like 15 kilos. Um, and, and he was really, but, but as, you know, as Stella, his wife will say, you know, Julian, is up and down, but he does. I think he's generally he's hopeful at the moment. Um, whether or not I can join that hope, I don't know. That was so moving and thank you so much, Brad, for that wonderful slideshow. And again, we really uh, want to thank John Pilger and thank his family for everything that he's done and rest in power, John Pilger. Please do come if you can to the live show that we're doing on January 16th at 7 p.m. at the People's Forum at 320 West 37th Street between 8th and 9th Avenue you can get tickets at peoplesforum.org. Again, that's peoplesforum.org. The guests will be Abby Martin, Rania Kalik, and Claudia de la Cruz. The show is January 16th at 7 p.m. at the People's Forum. And if you can't make it, we'll be streaming it right here, youtube.com slash the Katie Halper Show. Again, please like the stream. Please subscribe to the Katie Halper Show. Please become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show. And once again, thank you for everything, John Pilger. Rest in power. Okay.